When I was a student, we studied the things that the early Christian teachers wrote about. And one of the things that they wrote about was this thing called Gnosticism. And when I was a student in the 60s, <clears throat> nobody much cared about Gnosticism because we didn't think that would ever rear its head again. It was an odd, ancient idea, and we'd left it well behind. Little did we know, it was about to come back with a bang. And most people, even if they've never heard the word Gnosticism, have heard of the Da Vinci Code. And uh, that is a kind of a tip of the iceberg moment in our culture, where something which is in fact going on very powerfully underneath a lot of culture really poked its head above water. And the, the point about Gnosticism is to say things are not what they seem. The outward things that you can see are deceptive and that actually there's a conspiracy going on and the powers that be are actually very dark and, and very uncomfortable things. And within yourself, if you look within yourself, you will find that there's a spark, a divine spark, which is somewhere inside you, which your outward trappings, your background, your upbringing, etc., have probably squashed and encouraged you to squash and you must now let it out. And so this conspiracy theory comes in many shapes and forms and sizes. One of the most popular is to say, well, in the early church, Jesus was really a teacher of this hidden wisdom, discovering the divinity within you, rather than this very Jewish idea of the kingdom of God coming on earth as in heaven. Afterwards, After all, earth is, is a place of shadows and, and, uh, and dark deceptions, and we surely have to escape from this earth and find the heavenly life instead. And so, when people have said this, they've said, well, we've discovered now quite a lot of these Gnostic Gospels. There was a great discovery of them in Egypt in, uh, in the 1940s at a place called Nag Hammadi, and particularly, famously, the so-called Gospel of Thomas. And these are not stories about Jesus coming and announcing that God is becoming king on earth as in heaven. They are collections of sayings in which Jesus is teaching a sort of esoteric wisdom through which people can gain a different perspective on their life and perhaps ultimately learn that the present outward life isn't the really significant thing and that the important thing is some kind of heavenly existence instead. Now, then people, scholars like Bart Ehrman, Elaine Pagels, several others, have said quite stridently, this was the real early Christianity. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tried to cover it up and muddle it up. And they told this very Jewish story about things going on on earth and with um, sacraments and all of these things. Um, whereas this Gnosticism was the really exciting, subversive stuff which the Orthodox Church then squelched. And that plays then into the conspiracy theory which has actually characterized the whole of the last 200 years of Western culture, that the church ever since at least the Middle Ages has had a major power trip and that the Enlightenment was all about people saying, we've now discovered it's all based on a mistake, it's all a load of old rope, and we're going for genuine religion instead, which is a private spiritual thing. So it's very much an Enlightenment movement. Indeed, the very word Enlightenment indicates a kind of putting down a marker that we're going in this direction. Um, and you can now see it not only in things like the Da Vinci Code, but in half the movies and, and cheap novels that are written. A lot of movies are all about somebody discovering who they really are. And, you know, we all rather like the tale of the ugly duckling because we all rather feel that maybe I'm somebody more important than I thought I was or whatever. So it's rather an appealing myth, but it is a myth because the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which have every historical reason to claim to go back to Jesus himself rather than the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of the Egyptians and these other ones, they are about this very Jewish first century movement, which is not about a God saying, forget this world and discover your inner reality instead, but about a God who says, I am reclaiming this world because it is good, it's my lovely creation, and you are a wonderful piece of that creation, and so you, made in my image, are now to be reborn to discover redemption. Gnosticism isn't about redemption, it's about self-discovery. It's not about forgiveness, it's about simply saying, I'm actually all right as I am, you see. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are far, far more challenging. And that, I think, is why our culture has been so suspicious of them. But actually, this is a malaise which goes quite deep within Western Christianity, that we haven't really known what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were there for, which was to tell us about God's kingdom coming on earth as in heaven, the project of new creation being launched with Jesus. And so we have, in a sense, left our blind side open to the Gnostic attack. And when now it's so popular in our culture 
many Christians don't really know how to undermine its claims and simply try and wave it away. But it's very important we recognize that the attack on Gnosticism has to be based on creation, on resurrection, on the love of God for creation. And let's not forget, just as a tailpiece, in the second century, according to Ehrman and Pagels and people, what you see is um, these Christians on their way to being orthodox, on their way, way to being socially conformist to a great established church and the Church of Constantine and so on. And we must not forget that uh, in America particularly, Constantine is just a very bad thing because for them, any idea of an established church is a complete no-no. You know, They don't actually understand how it works, but still. Um, uh, and that it was the Gnostics who were being persecuted and who were suffering at the hands of these Orthodox Christians. In fact, when you look at the second century, it isn't the people reading the Gospel of Thomas and so on who are being thrown to the lands and burnt at the stake and sawn in two. It's the people who are reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and Paul and Revelation and all the rest of them. And the high point of that is Irenaeus, who goes to be Bishop of Lyon in the late 170s of the first century. And his predecessor as Bishop and several others had just been martyred, not because they were teaching people to discover their inner divine spark. That would have been quite all right. Caesar isn't bothered about that. But because they were preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And Irenaeus comes to Lyon and he carries on preaching the genuinely subversive gospel and attacks Gnosticism in order to make sure that the message of Jesus really does the business that it was supposed to instead of being itself subverted into this really self-help, self-cosseting, self-discovery religion which is so popular in the 21st century but which has so little to do with genuine Christianity. This illuminated timeline explores a fascinating relationship between Christian theology and modern thought from 1600 to the present day. It is both interactive and multimedia. If when exploring a particular period, text becomes illuminated, that will signify that there is additional resources on that topic to be revealed. By clicking that item, a page will appear with further information, often featuring video footage of expert commentary on that author's thought. Norman has always traced the most important themes in his theology. But in addition Back to, to these multimedia series. resources, this timeline has another layer, another dimension to it. If at the bottom left hand corner of each page you press the button entitled Movements, many of the theological and philosophical movements of that period will appear. Again, some are interactive, revealing more multimedia resources. The layout of this timeline is not complex. At the top of each page, cultural and intellectual developments are listed. And at the bottom, chronologically parallel theological works and events are found. So overall, as you can see, there is so much to explore and discover in this illustrated, interactive and multimedia timeline of the fascinating relationship between Christian theology and modern thought. <laughs>